Hello everyone. Today we will be looking at the interview questions which a typical DevOps engineer faces in an interview. This is both for people who are new to the DevOps world and people who are experienced in other fields like Linux or production support and are willing or wanting to move to DevOps. So let's take a look. So pretty much it'll start with questions about yourself. They'll have a resume in front of them as obviously you would have sent your resume to them. So they'll look at that and they will ask you to quickly walk them through your resume and tell them what you've been doing in your previous project. So you'll have to summarize this in a way in which, you know, kind of walk through all three layers and you have to tell them that you worked on a team where you kind of managed AW, the AWS part and the automation part of it. So uh, that can also include telling them about any infrastructure deployment scripts which you have written. It could also include any configuration management that you've done and deployment automation you might have done. So it would also include things like setting up a monitoring system, setting up the entire thing on the cloud, collaborating with teams, uh, everything. Maybe what your code review process is, scrum methodology, whatever you do in your team. They will definitely ask you what uh, your team size was. So you could say you've been working on a team of about five to six people, which would include team leads, consultants, managers, scrum masters, etc. What was your role in the team? That's the typical DevOps role in which you've written code for automation of stuff on the cloud. Uh, they'll, they'll ask, how good are you at programming? Uh, this is a typical question that's asked of a DevOps engineer to gauge whether he's fit for the DevOps role or not. So you would answer that you've not written full-fledged applications such as Java or Ruby on Rails, but you're good at Ruby, Python, Shell, and Perl from a scripting language perspective. Uh, maybe I'm not a full-fledged programmer, but I know the ins and outs of scripts. One of the typical questions is, are you from the dev side or the ops side? And the answer is you're from the ops side, but you have a good hold on the programming languages which are used for scripting and configuration management, and whatever code is required, you can write that easily. They may ask, how quickly can you learn, which is a gauge of the candidate's ability to learn new things and flexibility to adjust himself to a new environment. Given the chance, can you architect an application? The answer is definitely yes. Tell them you have been working with architects recently and that you've been contributing to the architecture from a DevOps perspective and giving your input so that the application could be developed in a more easily deployable manner. Given the chance to lead a team, can you do that? You'll say, yes, definitely, I have more than five years' experience. Typically, this is true for people who have had at least five years' experience leading a team because less than that would really not be meaningful. The next level of questions that come up in a DevOps interview are typically Linux questions. These questions could be anything from the Linux world, but typically these are the most common questions. What is the command to view the cron tab? The command is cron tab hyphen L. What is an alias in Linux? An alias in Linux is something that tells you the shortcuts on that system. These are defined in the etc bash rc file. What does the chmod command do? The chmod command basically allows you to change the permission of a file in Linux. It can be changed from read write in executable mode, so it could be changed from read to read write or to read write execute depending on the use case. What is ssh port forwarding? It's a way to actually forward your ports through SSH protocols. So it allows you to bypass firewalls and also tunnel ports through uh, strictly guarded environments. So this is one of the ways which you can connect to instances or services in your private subnets in AWS or your data center. The next question is, what is a zombie process? Now this is about the most common Linux question asked in an interview. Zombie process is a process which is in a terminated state, but which has not yet released the resources. So basically, it's most commonly a child process where the parent has exited, but the child is still there. Basically, its entry is in the process table. They'll ask how to check the top CPU consuming processes, and you can use the top command to check that. The top command gives you a very nice view of the entire Linux process table. Looking at the top deployment related questions, which is one of the most important areas people use to gauge their candidates, one of the questions which comes up is, what is a blue-green deployment? So a blue-green deployment is something that uh, in which you have X number of resources running your application and say that number is 10. So you have 10 servers in a web farm. Now in a blue-green deployment, what you do is take out half of those from the actual production state. You deploy the new code on those. 
Now, in the meantime, the other five, or the other half, would be serving the production traffic. And these five would not be hindered or hampered in any way. Now, the first five in which you complete the deployment, which you've taken out of the actual production load, you put those back in, and you wait for those to come back into service. And then you take the other five out of the actual load, and you start deploying on those. So in a blue-green deployment, what happens is you never let the end user see the downtime. It's an always-up environment. How do you do a hot deployment? This is just a rephrasing of the previous question, really. A hot deployment can be done either by having two environments of the same size, and then you redirect traffic through a load balancer or a proxy service to one of the environments, deploy it on the other, and then redirect to the first one and apply it to the second. And just like a blue-green deployment, you never showed the end user the downtime. And what is your rollback strategy? This is something you need to be very confident about because every deployment should have a rollback associated with it. So let's say your deployment fails. How do you roll back the system? It has to be linked to a blue-green or a hot deployment. So you have to say that you have a Jenkins job or a script which basically does a blue-green deployment. And in the middle of that blue-green deployment, it checks to see whether or not services are up and running. And at the least, the SGTP endpoints of your application are running or not. Have you used Jenkins for deployment? Yes, I've used it, and you've used it using a couple of strategies. You've used it with plugins, and uh, I've used it with my script, so my plugins used to deploy code on the environment using build or publish or SSH. And I have also had uh, my Ansible or Chef or Puppet code, which used to do the deployment for me. Uh, so we used to use Jenkins as an orchestrator and Puppet and Chef and Ansible for the actual deployment of the target service. One of the other common questions from a deployment perspective is, what Jenkins plugins have you used? Uh, you would say Jenkins plugins you've used, uh, Maven and Gradle. I've used Cobetra for testing, PMD for programmatic mistake detection, Aztec for Ruby on Rails testing, Karma for Angular JS testing, and integration with S3. I've also used Git plugin for checking out code, SVN plugin for checking out SVN repositories, upstream, downstream plugin for connecting the builds, in addition to this, I've also used Archive Artifacts plugin, Publish HTML Reports plugin to publish test reports. Have you ever used user data for deployment? You answer yes, I've used it in AWS. So when you have instances behind load balances, we used to use it. Uh, it will actually define the deployment script so that every time a new instance comes up in the auto scaling group, it has got the latest code on it. So that latest code is checked out using the sh command, which is specified inside the user data. Looking at the AWS questions, so what is a VPC? A VPC is a slice of the Amazon cloud which they give you to run your resources. What is the difference between a public and private subnet? A public subnet is a subnet which is directly accessible from the internet. A private subnet is a subnet that is not accessible from the internet. It's only accessible from within the VPC. What is reserved instance? A reserved instance is an instance which is reserved for you by Amazon for a year, and they give you significant price reductions on that. You can buy that no upfront, partial upfront, or full upfront payments, and you get discounts from 20 to 60% based on the payment type and terms. What is the difference between spot instance and reserved instance? The spot instance is like a bid instance, where you have a specific price which you have bid, and based on that you are assigned instances. Now the moment your bid is lower than the next highest bid, your instance is terminated and it's assigned to the next highest bidder. A reserved instance, on the other hand, is not a biddable instance. You have to buy it for specific terms. What is CloudFormation? CloudFormation is an orchestration or an infrastructure or a server deployment tool, a managed server deployment tool or service which Amazon provides. So it takes a JSON as an input. In that JSON, you provide everything that is required to build up an environment from VPS to servers to buckets, everything. So it's an Amazon-provided service. It lets you build entire application stacks uh, from scratch. Have you used Route 53? Yes, I've used Route 53. I used it for managing DNS. I use it to redirect our code ID DNS to Route 53 using Amazon name servers. And then from there in Route 53, we used to create uh, CNM entries, A records, MX records, TXT records, and uh, we used to manage the entire DNS from there. What is the best feature of AWS which you like? 
I like the Auto Scaling Group and the Elastic Load Balancer because it allows you to infinitely scale your application to any level. Coming to Configuration Management. Uh, which Configuration Management tool have you used? So you can say that you've used all three, Chef, Ansible, and Puppet, in one project or another. I have good hands-on experience with each of them, and I've written Chef Cookbooks, Puppet Modules, and Ansible Playbooks. What is the difference between Chef and Ansible? So Chef is a Ruby-based tool. It uses Ruby as its main programming language. It's open source, just like Ansible. Chef uses a client-server and client-only architecture. So the difference is that Ansible is simply an agentless tool. So there is no agent in Ansible whatsoever. In Chef, there are two methodologies. One is agent-based and the other is agentless. But if you talk about the difference, one of the differences is that there is no agent in Ansible. And the other difference is Ansible uses YAML uh, for defining the state of the systems and its playbooks, whereas Chef uses Ruby for defining the state of the systems in its cookbooks. And it's more of a programming language when it comes to Chef. And uh, YAML in Ansible is not really a programming language. It's more of a statically typed code. Have you written any cookbooks or modules and uh, the playbooks? Yes, I've used both from uh, the repositories, which each of these configuration management tools provide. So for Chef, I've used the Chef Supermarket cookbooks. And I've also written custom cookbooks. For Puppet, I've used modules from Puppet Forge, and I've written my own modules for custom applications. For Ansible, I've used the community-provided playbooks as well, as I've uh, written my own custom playbooks for provisioning of instances on the cloud, as well as managing. And now production support. What is the biggest issue you faced in a production environment? So you can say that there's an application we used to run on the cloud, and there was some application deployment error. It was a logical error in the application which caused an error behind the elastic load balancer. So we had an elastic load balancer which was tied to the auto scaling group. So it kind of snowballed the application and we were not able to control it. So the application scaled infinitely and it was snowballing the instances. So we had to go in and manually freeze the size of the auto scaling group. Once the size was frozen, we were able to go into the instances, check the logs, fix the issue, rebuild the IMI, restart the auto-scaling process. So that was one of the biggest issues in production I've faced recently. What is your DR strategy in a live website? So a DR strategy is that you do a failover check using Route 53 DNS. So one of them is a DNS-based failover in which you've got an exact replica of your environment, your web servers, your database, your cache. So your database may not be synced in real time with a DR. So it could be a one day behind sync. So the traffic is switched to DR whenever there's a downtime in production, automatically through a DNS switch. The other DR strategy is that you can have instances in two availability zones. And then you can have your load balancer to switch traffic based on the availability of those two zones. But that is a same region DNR. So from a multi-region DNR, the best option is to have a DNS-based switch. And you can also have an interface tool, an interface proxy, which can route traffic based on the health of your endpoints. How do you scale a production web service? So if you're on the cloud, you can use the auto scaling group, which will scale automatically based on demand. If you don't want to go into instances and you don't want to manage instances, you can use the Elastic Beanstalk for a managed stack, which uh, takes care of the load balancing itself. Now, if you have an application which is already containerized, it's a better practice to run them on ECS on the cloud, which would allow you to scale your applications based on demand, and you can create an application load balancer there. If you're in-house, you can scale your application by having a container management system in which you can have some base hosts on which you run multiple services. So you can keep on adding multiple hosts to that cluster, and you don't have to worry about the scaling part because the hosts can be added on the fly to that hardware. So your Docker cluster, like a Swarm or a Kubernetes, can uh, take care of getting those new machines into your cluster and running the containers which are existing on your cluster on those new machines. Thanks a lot, everyone. This is all from the interview question. Hey, want to become an expert in cloud computing? Then subscribe to Simply Learn's channel and click here to watch more such videos. To nerd up and get certified in cloud computing, click here.